during the webinar, I'm actually going to wait for about uh, 30 seconds just to allow others all to get in. And then I'll proceed with a couple of formal announcements and the introductions. Okay, well, hi everyone. Uh, and one, thank you very much for joining at whatever time of day or night it is uh, for you, depending on your location. Uh, I'm Tony Seish, I'm the director of the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. And I want to start first with a couple of announcements on behalf uh, of the Ash Center before we move on to our proceedings. First, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. A very appropriate acknowledgement for the discussion that we're actually going to have today. Just to remind you that today's event is being recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center YouTube uh, channel. Of course, you're welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the duration of the event, but do remember to submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead of submitting them uh, via the chat where they're more likely uh, to be overlooked. Now, very briefly, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's talk. And we're extremely lucky to have with us Professor William Alford, who is the Jerome and uh, Joan L. Carlin Professor of Law uh, at the Harvard Law School. He's the director of the East Asian Legal Studies Program, the founding chair of Harvard uh, Law School Project on Disability, which provides pro bono services to a number uh, of nations and groups. And uh, in addition to that, holds many other functions and has many distinguished awards. But I'd like now to give the floor to Professor Alfred, who will introduce our speakers for today's talk and will moderate the discussions. Over to you, Bill. Thank you, Tony. And thanks also to uh, Ed, Laura, Melissa, Julianne, and others at the Ash Center. So welcome to Dennis Kwok and Elizabeth Dunkervoort. Uh, Dennis is a senior fellow at the Ash Center and non-resident distinguished fellow at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. Before taking up these posts, he was a leading figure in legal and civic life in Hong Kong. A graduate of King's College London, he first qualified as a solicitor there and then as a barrister in Hong Kong, where he developed a very thriving practice regarding cross-border commercial disputes and international arbitration. In 2006, he was a founding member of the Hong Kong Civic Party. Now, in 2012, Dennis was elected to the Legislative Council in Hong Kong to represent the legal constituency, the legal profession, Hong Kong having functional constituencies. There, he focused on several vital issues, including access to justice and legal aid, the independence of the judiciary and of prosecutorial decisions, the protection of human rights, corporate social responsibility, human trafficking, and special education and student mental health. For that, his constituency, the legal profession, in 2016, re-elected him to a second four-year term with 69% of the vote. In November of 2020, he and three colleagues were disqualified from LegCo by the Hong Kong government pursuant to decision taken by the National People's Congress Standing Committee on a motion proposed at the request of the Hong Kong government. The stated basis for this was a failure to uphold the basic law. Uh, this in turn led to the mass resignation of several pan-Democrats from LegCo. Dennis soon thereafter announced he would be resigning from Hong Kong politics and subsequently he left Hong Kong. In 2021, in recognition of his career, the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, a leading organization of lawyers and academics from throughout the Commonwealth countries, honored him with its 2021 Commonwealth Law Conference Rule of Law Award. Elizabeth Donkervoort is a graduate of the University of Toronto and University of British Columbia with degrees in both law and Asian studies. Uh, after a brief stand in private practice, she worked with three civil society entities concerned with the rule of law and human rights. Freedom House, where she ran the emergency assistance program supporting human rights defenders. The International Republican Institute, where she was senior program manager for East Northeast Asia working on civil society, capacity, 
uh, both at the strategic and grassroots level, and most recently since last November uh, at the uh, ABA, American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. Elizabeth, in her remarks today and in the paper, is speaking for herself, not for the ABA Roley program. Uh, our format is as follows. Uh, Dennis and Elizabeth have given us a textured legal argument in the paper, and that's very important as a foundation for the policy recommendations that they make for the policy concerns that they express. Uh, for that reason, and because we have an audience with a variety of backgrounds, I've asked Dennis and Elizabeth to devote approximately the next 20 to 25 min minutes to giving us uh, the essence of their paper in terms that will be accessible to thoughtful individuals, not all of whom necessarily uh, have the blessing or curse of a legal education. Uh, I will then take the chair's prerogative to uh, raise a few questions that I hope will capture broad concerns. Uh, we will then devote the remainder of our time uh, to questions from those of you joining this webinar. Uh, some of those questions were sent ahead yesterday. Uh, others uh, can be added today in the uh, Q&A space. Um, we're probably not gonna have time to get to all questions. I'll try to pick those that I think are most substantive and most broadly representative. So with that, I turn over to Dennis and Elizabeth. Thank you both very much. Well, um, <clears throat> Professor Alfred, Professor Saik, thank you for the introduction and a special thanks to Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation for publishing our paper and for um, agreeing to host this seminar and understand that um, uh, uh, there, there, there's a good uh, uh, amount of interest in our paper and I've since publication, uh, Liz and I, we've spoken to many people who have expressed interest in the paper. And the uh, question I get often asked is, why did we write it? Uh, I think um, it is important to state uh, at the outset that um, Elizabeth and I wrote the paper, um, not so much to tell people, oh, things are really bad in Hong Kong, things are really terrible, the decisions coming out of China. Um, we understand that for a lot of international businesses, and especially for NGOs, Hong Kong and China remains not an option, but a must for them to continue to engage and deal with, uh, both as a civil society and as a market. Um, and we understand that. And, but what we want to do is to explain that, um, given the uh, decision to uh, promulgate the national security law for Hong Kong and a series of many other different laws and decisions coming out of Beijing, there has been a paradigm shift uh, in terms of the legal and political environment for Hong Kong and also vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So we are, we, we are trying to, of course, um, uh, to, to uh, explain that paradigm shift and to explain what are the new risks and challenges that has been faced, that will be faced by international businesses uh, and NGOs going ahead. And so that's the purpose of our paper. And also, I think it is important to emphasize that in China right now, um, the, the laws has always been, um, I guess, uh, 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 has always been the case that the law is a, a, an extension of politics uh, and that the laws are, are really um, there to um, achieve the objects and goals of the regime. And in order to understand the law and the legal development, we also have to understand uh, the political developments in China and in Hong Kong and the decisions that are coming out. And um, looking at Hong Kong, of course, there's the promulgation of the national security law, which we say is a game changer for Hong Kong and the paradigm shift for its legal environment. But you also, we will touch on um, the changes to the electoral systems in Hong Kong, which effectively um, is a wholesale change in the sense that you will no longer have credible democratic opposition in um, both the legislative council, certainly not at the CE level, and certainly uh, not at the legislative council. So that's a complete change to what we had before, whereas there was some sort of balance uh, between different political voices now um, and going forward, you will see that um, there will be a um, complete uh, set of new pro Beijing voices dominating completely the uh, legislative council and at the policy level. And that's one important thing to uh, uh, understand. And also we'll touch about, but upon other changes like the weaponization of the oath taking system for all office holders in Hong Kong. 
um, uh, has been expanded from sen senior civil servants to junior civil servants. Of course, LESCO members always had to take oath and uh, judges also has to take oath. But the weaponization of that oath taking system through interpretation of the basic law, Article 104, and how that would affect um, the legal landscape. I will uh, touch on that. But first of all, I just want to, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the national security law, the national security law is fundamentally different from other Hong Kong legislation in that it was directly promulgated by the National People's Congress Standing Committee. And there was no consultation whatsoever in Hong Kong. And there has been no, uh, it, 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 there's no consultation and also the national security law has completely bypassed the local uh, legislative process. Um, the significance of that is that basically this law is written in Beijing uh, mainland style, and it is um, uh, significantly broader and more vague than what we you have in the normally in a piece of Hong Kong legislation. Uh, and it is deliberately so because um, uh, uh, that is how mainland legislation are often drafted. So you have this mainland law uh, that is uh, being applied in Hong Kong directly. Um, so you have phrases like, for example, um, an offense would, um, there is an offense to provoke by unlawful means hatred amongst Hong Kong residents towards the central people's government or Hong Kong government, which is likely to cause serious consequences. <clears throat> Uh, or um, if it, it's an offense to seriously disrupt the formulation and implementation of laws and policies of government, which are likely to cause serious consequences. Now, you don't need to be a lawyer to um, uh, immediately raise question marks over what, are, what is meant by unlawful means and what is meant by causing hatred uh, and what is likely to cause serious consequences. I mean, those are already question marks about you know, what you can and cannot do. So, but those are deliberately drafted uh, in such a way that it creates very broad and vague offenses. And as a result of bypassing the consultation, the local legislative process, what you have is uh, a law that is um, very broad and very vague. Um, of course, the, the government, the official view, uh, 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 what they tell you is that, oh, um, there are only a creation of four uh, new criminal offenses. Uh, as long as you, they're very clear, as long as you stay, stay away from them, then you uh, would not be uh, in any legal risk. Uh, Elizabeth and I would take a different view. Uh, we uh, uh, take the view that uh, this law is not only just about creating four different offenses, but it actually creates a completely new uh, legal system. In fact, I would say that the national security law is now uh, the new constitution for uh, Hong Kong's uh, legal and political system. Um, a lot of people ask, what is national security? Um, why are they so obsessed with national security? Um, how is it different from um, you know, uh, uh, the, the concept as traditionally understood in other common law jurisdictions or <clears throat> in other liberal democracies? And I would say that is most, first of all, most important to understand that the concept of national security, uh, first of all, is not defined under the Hong Kong national security law. Um, in order to understand what national security is, you need to look further to the PRC national security law and to understand how they traditionally understand national security. Um, I would quote uh, from a blog that was written by the chief secretary of Hong Kong uh, back in April uh, uh, this year during the National Security Education Day. Um, he said, and I quote, um, that the uh, traditional concept of national security normally deals with political security, territorial security, and military security as conventionally perceived. But extensive in breadth and depth, national security has a direct bearing on people's interests and encompasses more than 10 other key aspects, including economic security, cultural security, social security, technology security, cybersecurity, ecological security, resource security, nuclear security, overseas interest security, and some other emergence aspects like biosecurity, space security, deep sea security, and polar security. I'm sorry, that's a mouthful. Um, I, I, I don't myself understand a few of the concepts like polar security and, uh, uh, and, and you know, overseas interest security, but there you have it. Uh, uh, you know, this is not from a mainland official. 
This is a from the Chief Secretary of Hong Kong. He's the number two uh, highest uh, official in Hong Kong. I would say one of the most powerful person in Hong Kong right now is the Chief Secretary. And um, he, um, back in April, this, this was a blog um, uh, written by the Chief Secretary. And it tells you that the concept of national security in China, which is very broad, it encompasses all the uh, key industries that are vital to the national economy. And key industrial sectors and infra infrastructure projects are all part of national security. And so if you are in technology or in finance or in infrastructure uh, uh, projects, then you are uh, uh, very much in the national security realm. And that will be applied in Hong Kong uh, because the, uh, as I said, the, the, the concept of national security is not defined. And uh, you need to apply the PRC understanding of national security to understand what it means by national security under the NSL in Hong Kong. And um, shortly after we um, publish our paper, um, so in our paper, we argue that, the, you know, the very, you know, PRC has a very broad concept of national security, and it could be applied to commercial um, transactions and activities. And, um, you know, what we saw was that after we issued our paper, um, the IPO of uh, Didi Chuxing in New York was heavily scrutinized by the Beijing authorities on the ground that they were um, uh, acting potentially in breach of national security because they were compromising data security uh, by uh, opening themselves up for uh, investigation or um, a regulation by overseas regulators that could ask them to hand over very sensitive data uh, that were collected in China. And that amounts to a matter of national security. And we would say, and we argue, that the same kind of methodology and process could be applied in Hong Kong as well. Um, and uh, that is because under the NSL, uh, Article 3, it imposes a positive obligation on all executive authorities within the Hong Kong SAR to effectively pre prevent and suppress acts which threaten national security. What it means is that the national security law imposes an obligation on all of the executive branch, not just the traditional uh, uh, you know, executive branch within government. We would say that it applies to all statutory bodies as well. So the Sec uh, Securities for Futures and uh, Securities and Futures Commission, the uh, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, or other uh, statutory bodies or uh, quasi-government bodies would also uh, have a legal responsibility to look at matters of national security. Um, so we would say that if you're dealing with government regulators right now, you are also have to be aware of uh, a wholesale um, uh, a new set of risks uh, that may uh, you know, um, uh, concern national security. So very briefly, I wanna to touch on um, article 47 of the national security law, which is of significance because article 47 gives the power to the chief executive to um, effectively certify what amounts to national security and what amounts to state secrets. And that certification is binding on the courts. Um, you know, after we wrote our paper, the secretary for justice wrote a rebuttal to our paper uh, published in the Hong Kong lawyer in September. She of course didn't refer to our paper uh, expressly, but, but if you read it, it was a clear point to point rebuttal. And, you know, I think she and I, we, we agree on one thing, which is the use of the certification power by the chief executive pursuant to article 47 of the NSL is an act of state. It is an act of state by the uh, uh, central people's government to say that a certain matter or a certain set of facts uh, amounts to national security or state secrets. And that act of state, of course, is binding on the courts in Hong Kong and the courts can't question it, nor can the parties. And what worries me most is uh, this confirmation that this certification power is an act of state, which can be very politically driven which um, a decision coming out of Central People's Government and the National People's Congress are political decisions. And those decisions will become binding on a uh, court of law in Hong Kong. So a lot of people ask me, um, you know, um, yeah, but the courts in Hong Kong are still independent, aren't they? They can independently adjudicate uh, a case that's concerning national security. Uh, and I would say that, well, think again, if, um, you know, 
the uh, central people's government and the chief executive can issue certification to bind the courts to say, this is a matter of national security and it is beyond challenge. Uh, it doesn't matter really um, how independent the courts are when the tracks are already laid out before them and they have no other option but to accept that uh, finding, accept that certification. And given how broad the concept of national security can be, it encompasses many, many facts and issues that could fall within the reign of uh, national security. And there are already um, uh, uh, provisions in the national security law with, which gives very broad powers to uh, the chief executive to effectively manipulate the legal system to uh, a, a way which uh, suits their interests. Now, um, I'll be very brief because um, I, I'll, I'll leave the rest of the time to, to uh, my, my co-author, Elizabeth. But I just want to comment before I leave uh, about uh, judicial independence, because a lot of people ask me, is the judiciary in Hong Kong still independent? Now, of course, when we look at these um, uh, questions, we have to look at the whole system. We have to look at the holistic, you know, systemic um, uh, setup of the judiciary to see whether it is still independent. What has changed? What has changed is that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that they are now weaponizing the oath taking system. They are, of course, all judges have to take judicial oaths, uh, 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 same with other many public offices. But what has changed in recent years is that they can summarily dismiss public office holders on the basis that they have um, uh, acted in breach of their oath, including yours truly. And the, um, the, 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 the way they interpret the oath is very fake. It is very um, un uncertain as to when you would act in breach of your oath, uh, thereby triggering the legal consequences of the interpretation of the basic law under Article 104. And judges know that. And if you are uh, a judge uh, presiding over a very sensitive case and the one way bow and the Dai Kung bow and the people's daily of the world have effectively pronounced a decision uh, that you, uh, uh, you know, they would expect to see. And there's this old um, uh, 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 system where they could weaponize it and summarily remove uh, people from public office. That is a systematic change to the system we had before where independence of the judiciary means exactly that. It means that judges cannot be removed without due process and uh, due considerations. But I believe that's a game changer when they can weaponize the oath taking system uh, in such a manner. And also there are nuances that people um, must, must, must understand that, for example, the chief secretary, um, uh, the number two in charge of the Hong Kong government is also in charge of judiciary administrative affairs. So they are in charge, the CS office is in charge of the budget for the judiciary. And he is also in charge of tabling motions at the Legislative Council for appointment of senior judges uh, for vetting by the Legislative Council. And he at the same time wears the hat, who is the person responsible for uh, ensuring that uh, patriots would administer Hong Kong. And he has to ensure that ho holders of public offices are patriots or someone who would um, uphold the basic law and will not act in breach of the oath. Now, given that he is uh, uh, in such a key position and he's also in charge of uh, putting forward names for uh, senior judicial appointments to be approved by LegCo, you can understand how the structure again has changed, that the CS is now has this new responsibility of uh, uh, comprehensively implementing the need for uh, patriots to administer public affairs in Hong Kong, plus the oath system where they could weaponize it and summarily remove people from public office. You can see the combined effect it has on the system, the legal system, and I would argue, including the judiciary in Hong Kong. So you can make up your own mind as to whether you think as a whole, the judiciary is, uh, is still systematically independent, but um, that raises a serious question marks over um, um, its independence and other uh, legal uh, issues. So, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions you have re relating those um, issues. It's, it's complex, but um, we'll try our best to um, uh, uh, summarize it as best as I can. Um, thank you, Professor Alford. Thank you. And over to Elizabeth. 
Well, thank you, uh, Professor Alford, and thank you, Dennis, and the Ash Center for inviting us to speak to you all today about the situation in Hong Kong. Again, I want to start off by clarifying that the analysis and points that I'm going to be making today are based on my own personal opinion and do not reflect uh, the ABA policy or its positions. So Dennis has provided a really excellent summary of why we wrote the paper um, and our analysis of the law and its potential impacts on businesses. Um, and now, as we argued in the paper, there is this tendency to draw a distinct divide between businesses and politics. But in a party state such as China, uh, the People's Republic of China, rather, the separation can't be done. In party states, the law and politics are intrinsically tied and concepts uh, like judicial independence, as Dennis was just explaining, um, and as we understand it in liberal democracies, do not apply in a party state like the PRC. Under the PRC constitution, the court is expected to adhere to the Chinese Communist Party or the CCP. Um, I'm posting some links in the chat um, where you're not supposed to post your questions um, that explore this interplay between the party and politics and the law uh, in greater detail. And I encourage you to read them and our paper as well. But because of this tie between politics and the law, how civil society is treated by the state is a really important harbinger for what might happen to businesses. And now this isn't to say that businesses will experience the same things as civil society workers, but rather what happens to civil society represents one end of the spectrum of potential impacts that businesses could experience if their work were to suddenly become political. And now we saw this in the case of Didi as uh, Dennis was just mentioning, and as well as Amp Financial uh, over the summer, as data and technology has been growing in national importance in the PRC. Now, the national security law, which is the subject of today's talk for Hong Kong, has brought this issue into stark relief as we've watched this political lens of a party state being stretched over Hong Kong's common law system. We're seeing a collision of two very different approaches to the law. So earlier this year, the Chinese Communist Party released its plan for building rule of law in China. I'm also posting that link in the chat. But this plan very clearly lays out the concept of socialist rule of law, where the party is to play a very leading role in developing and overseeing the direction of the legal system. Now, this is very different from rule of law, where people, including the government, are to be accountable under the law. So, you know, as Dennis mentioned, we are in the midst of this paradigmatic shift in the region, and Hong Kong is at the center of that. So with this in mind, I just want to dive very quickly uh, deeper into two issues we touched upon in our paper and then looking forward to having a very robust discussion in the Q&A session. Um, first, uh, as Dennis noticed, noted, we have this very expansive definition of what constitutes national security. The breadth of this uh, definition or lack thereof and lack of clear guidelines creates an atmosphere of uncertainty. Uh, and in my work working in authoritarian states for the last decade, I've seen this tactic of uncertainty in the atmosphere uh, really playing to the governing party's advantage in several ways. But you know, the chief one that I want to talk about today is about self-censorship. Specifically, people in organizations operating in this uncertain environment often self-censor in ways that are much more conservative than authorities would have actually imposed themselves. So in the case of Hong Kong, what we saw was many NGOs closing or disbanding proactively out of concern that they would be found in violation of the national security law. And for those that remained operational and in Hong Kong, they report a very high degree of self-censorship. And this self-censorship has several negative impacts. First and foremost, it makes fundraising more difficult. Many Many of these organizations relied on international funding and they ended up proactively cutting ties with international donors because of the national security laws focus on collusion with foreign forces. Um, at the same time, because of this uncertain environment, uh, the general public's attitude in Hong Kong towards NGOs has chilled with respect to providing funding uh, simply because of the fact that they're concerned by funding or donating to these organizations, they may also fall afoul of the national security law. Second, self-censorship makes cooperation, which is a key strategy for NGOs and other organizations with limited resources, much more difficult. A recent survey of NGOs in Hong Kong revealed that collaboration between NGOs, as well as between NGOs and businesses in the government, has declined since the law came into effect. 
And these organizations also report limiting their contact with other like-minded organizations outside of Hong Kong, such as the Milk Tea Alliance, out of concern that it would violate uh, the national security law. And you know, we're at a time where we're facing challenges that are global in nature. And it, collaboration and people-to-people -people exchanges across borders is more than ever more critical. Um, and so this atmosphere of uncertainty and fear poses real challenges, not only within Hong Kong's borders, but outside as well. So, you know, what we tried to do in our paper was explain how you might go about defining national security law to help uh, solidify how you want to operate in Hong Kong. And we outlined several key party and government documents that are instructive. You know, since the time we uh, published this paper, there have been several more events that have taken place uh, that can provide us with further clarity. First is the series of new laws and amendments that have been adopted or proposed. Um, there's the public offices ordinance that Dennis mentioned. Um, and as you may recall, in November 2019, pro-democracy candidates swept the district council elections, taking control of 17 out of 18 district councils. Um, since that time, because of this law, 268 of those elected have been disqualified, resigned, or left the city because of their because their patriotism was in question. Um, another piece of legislation um, that I want to draw your attention to are the amendments to the privacy ordinance to address concerns about doxing, which is sharing of personal identifying information for malicious intent. One small but significant amendment was the change to the defenses under Section 64 from publishing information for news activities to publishing information for lawful news activities. When you consider this in the larger context where we're seeing greater interference and pressure on the media in Hong Kong and the likely adoption of the fake news law, this foreshadows greater control over information in Hong Kong in the near future. Similarly, we have commitments um, from officials to uh, draft further national security legislation under Article 23 of the Basic Law, which again suggests a trajectory of greater control of over, over information and association in Hong Kong. We also have the actions of officials that have taken place over the last several months. You know, I've mentioned several uh, organizations have disbanded. Some of them have done this because of sustained attacks by state-backed media. Um, and in August, several local NGOs were issued notices um, under Section 43 of the National Security Law to provide information related to their work. Um, one of them refused to comply with the notice uh, because they felt that it was in violation of their rights. And as a result, five members of its board and leadership were arrested and other organizations that received the notice have since disbanded. We've also seen self-regulating bodies are coming under threat, such as the chartered accountants with rumors that their self-regulatory authorities would be limited. And also over the summer, the Law Society of Hong Kong held its elections for its council. Both the Hong Kong chief executive and the secretary of justice issued not so veiled warnings to the members of the law society, what is supposed to be an independent legal body, on how they should vote. Five of the candidates who were viewed as progressive came under considerable pressure after announcing their candidacy, and one was ultimately forced to withdraw the day before the elections were to take place. So these trends indicate greater control over information and association will persist in Hong Kong and that national security threats could be applied to a large number of activities and a large number of sectors. So if you're an organization seeking to operate in Hong Kong, you will need to conduct ongoing and constant risk assessments to fully understand how you can operate safely in this very rapidly changing environment. Um, that was a very brief overview. I'm sorry, I went slightly over time, but I'm looking forward to having a robust discussion, discussion in the Q&A. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Dennis. So let me take the chair's prerogative and start with, um, I'll, I'll try to restrict myself to two questions. One, uh, a little more legally focused than the other. So, so Dennis, you mentioned the uh, judiciary, and as you say, Article 47 of the National Security Law provides the court's obtain a certificate from the chief executive to certify whether an act involves national security or whether relevant evidence includes involves state secrets when those issues come up in the adjudication of a case. Um, now, if, if, the, if that happens often uh, in civil and commercial cases, as opposed to openly political cases, those are political uh, dissent and the like, um, isn't there a danger if the chief executive is too promiscuous about this, uh, that it will jeopardize Hong Kong's future as an international center for business. 
And second part of that question, um, assuming then that that doesn't happen all of the time, um, is there a capacity in common law judges uh, to, to interpret ambiguous or vague provisions of the law, which, which you rightly said there were a large number, in a manner that's protective of rights, protective of uh, due process? Um, and so, yes, final uh, interpretation authority for the national security law uh, for, uh, reposes with the National People's Congress Standing Committee, but uh, they're not going to intervene on every last day-to-day -day, um, uh, application interpretation of it. So a long-winded question with two parts, but I wanted to give you at least one legal question about the role of the judiciary. So over yeah. to you, Dennis. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bill. That's a great question. I agree with you that the, um, I don't foresee the use of the Article 47 certification power to happen on a daily basis. But I think what um, you should be concerned about if you're an international company or an NG NGO dealing with a very sensitive matter or a matter that could fall within the scope of national security, say, for example, a uh, sensitive uh, piece of uh, technology, IP rights litigation, or um, you are dealing with an MA that in, involves a major infrastructure project in China. Those are all uh, with, uh, could fall within the ambit of uh, uh, the national security. So point number one. Point number two is that um, that provision is broad enough to cover many, uh, all cases, uh, if civil or criminal. And if you have a case against a state-owned enterprise or a major PRC conglomerate, uh, and if they claim that certain matter amounts to national security, that certification power becomes relevant. And the CE could intervene in a set of proceedings to say that a certain matter that you're dealing with in this case amounts to national security. Now that could severely upset uh, the balance of powers uh, uh, between the parties in a set of litigation uh, or even arbitration that could um, really give uh, advantage to a, a state-owned enterprise or a, a, a PRC conglomerate who can claim that power uh, to say that um, uh, with the certification of the CE and in turn the central people's government, this dispute involves a piece of um, national security or a trade secret. There, the, the courts are, uh, do not have jurisdiction to uh, independently adjudicate uh, whether that really is the case, because that certification is binding. Now, I think, Bill, 10 years ago, I would agree with you that they would be very careful uh, in not doing anything that would upset uh, the, the, the status of Hong Kong. But nowadays, I, what I see is that the political decisions that are come, uh, coming out of Beijing is not putting uh, Hong Kong's international uh, financial status as the top consideration. I would say that the top consideration right now are all domestically political considerations that is important from the CCP's perspective. Um, an interesting piece of development is the, uh, the threat to impose the PRC anti-sanctions laws into Hong Kong. Now, it was proposed in the National People's Congress and then it was later withdraw withdrawn. Now, you don't need to be an expert in the financial field to, to know that if the PRC anti-sanctions law are applied in Hong Kong, it would kill a lot of the Hong Kong's uh, financial institutions because they cannot be made to comply with PRC sanctions law and with US sanctions law at the same time. But that um, apparently obvious consideration was missing from the original decision when someone pressed the button in Beijing to say, we have to do this in Hong Kong. I'm sure that person or that group of person know of the drastic consequences, but they still went ahead and, and uh, 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 do it. But, uh, you know, was last minute pulled back by by obviously more rational, sensible voices uh, within the administration and say, you know, if you do this, you're going to kill us all. Um, so th that, that I think is an interesting highlight between the sometimes out of sync uh, political decisions that are coming out of Beijing and the impact it would have on economic policies. They are not always in sync. Uh, and oftentimes political considerations trump all other considerations. If I could just interject, sorry, just add on two things. Um, I completely agree with what Dennis was saying about um, Hong Kong's status as an international center isn't a top priority. And, you know, we could do an entire session on the Greater Bay Area. But I think if you really look at the rhetoric that is going on in the region and has been escalating and accelerating for the last several years, it's the GBA is the priority and bringing Hong Kong in line with Shenzhen and the other eight uh, 
cities is what's really important. And also, uh, you know, to your point, um, Professor Alford, and to one of the questions in the Q&A, well, you can have this bifurcated system, you cannot, as we argue in the paper, completely separate politics from the law, because that's just not what happens through a party state lens. And if you look at the pressures that are on the judiciary, even if they have judicial discretion, you have to question how that's going to be exercised. I mean, this past spring, we had one situation uh, where Marie Yuan Kaning was supposed to be uh, appointed to the CFA, the Court of Final Appeal, and she ended up having to withdraw under rumors because of pressure. People felt that her husband, who was the former chief justice, was going to be um, exerting undue influence on her. But So we're already seeing the construction of the CFA um, is being politically maneuvered as as well. Thanks. And uh, go to my second question so we leave time for the chat. So my second question is less legal and more practical. Um, you uh, rightly discuss uh, the concerns that business and NGOs uh, may have uh, about the new climate. I, I've certainly heard uh, that anecdotally from uh, several people I know. Um, presumably, if there were a mass exodus of business from uh, Hong Kong, um, that might make things even worse for Hong Kong retaining uh, uh, any uh, measure of autonomy and vitality as a hub. So what, what's, what are your recommendations, Elizabeth and Dennis, for what a responsible company uh, or law firm or NGO in Hong Kong uh, ought to be doing to protect itself, to protect its employees, to protect its clients? Yeah, Bill, I mean, it, it's very hard um, for uh, uh, international company or especially NGOs to decide whether to withdraw their operations from Hong Kong. But, you know, frankly, it doesn't matter what we say. Business go where money can be made. I mean, um, that's the bottom line for a lot of them. Um, so uh, uh, they would do their internal assessment as to whether the risks outweigh uh, the benefits of doing uh, uh, having an operation in Hong Kong or in China. But I would say that I see from one of the chat, which is related to your question, Bill, is why should we concern about the Hong Kong national security law, given that we are already in China doing things uh, the Chinese way? Um, I think uh, uh, for international companies, you've got to realize the extraordinary thing about the NSL is the extraterritorial effect of the law. It applies to everyone, everyone in the world, including you and me, yeah, those of all who, who are not in Hong Kong, uh, you are uh, subject to the jurisdiction of that law. And um, for international companies, let's say you're a media company, um, you are outside of Hong Kong covering a piece of news that involves uh, criticism of the central people's government of the Hong Kong government. One of your staff, one of your journalists, uh, reporters who are going through Hong Kong in transit could be arrested for what he or she did outside of the region. And same applies to operations of international companies that what you do outside, uh, for example, you are transferring data in relation to a very sensitive piece of technology that involves national security outside uh, of uh, uh, China, outside of Hong Kong. Um, that act potentially has national security implications for uh, China then you are uh, 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 exposing your, yourself and your staff uh, to uh, being a uh, risk of being arrested or prosecuted under the NSL. So, you know, that's a game changer. It hasn't ha happened yet because um, I think we're still uh, in the early days in the sense that the NSL has only been in effect for uh, slightly more than a year. Uh, they are busy using the NSL to wipe out all political opposition, to wipe out uh, journalists, Apple Daily, radio hosts, uh, even speech therapists has been thrown into jail with bail denied um, because uh, they are trying to re-engineer re the Hong Kong society, es especially the political and civil side. Um, they haven't yet got to using the um, uh, NSL in a, a major way in terms of business affairs, but if um, there's a trend, and you're trying to look for a trend, I think what's the norm in China will soon become the norm in Hong Kong. And that is the trend we're looking at. And the norm in China is that national security issues frequently uh, features in commercial affairs and commercial transactions. I predict the same trend will happen in Hong Kong. And that is what they have to be aware of, the new risks and challenges. And also one last thing, they recently changed the immigration ordinance to give the power to the director of immigration to impose an exit ban 
on anyone in Hong Kong, including foreign residents. Now, they say that it was done for the purposes of uh, stopping refugees from coming into Hong Kong. First of all, I don't see the regulations that regulate that uh, coming out, which is very strange. When you have an ordinance passed, usually you have a regulations uh, within a very short time to regulate the exercise of that power. But no regulations has been tabled at the Legislative Council, none that I can, I'm, I'm aware of. And at the moment, the director of immigration in Hong Kong has the legal power to stop anyone from leaving Hong Kong. Now, of course, we all know that exit bans in China, in mainland China, are very uh, uh, common and foreign executives are, are, are very often detained uh, in China uh, without permission to leave until certain business matters are settled. Um, will that become the trend in Hong Kong? The, the law is there. Will they actually use it? Um, that's an, anyone's guess. Yeah, so just to add on to what uh, Dennis was saying, I, I shared a link in the chat to Harrison Brooken's China Law blog. Um, they do, they have several pieces on corporate kidnapping um, that have taken place in China, and it's uh, quiet, but something that happens a lot more frequently than I think a lot of people realize. Um, and obviously, as a Canadian, I'm very uh, close to the situation with Kovring and Spavor and very glad that they were sent home. But obviously, that sends a very chilling effect, I think, uh, across the board. Um, just, you know, in terms of the recommendations um, that you were uh, you were asking about, um, especially for NGOs, again, as Dennis was saying, we are trying, we're seeing an almost replication of the situation um, from the main in Hong Kong taking place right now. Um, organizations still operate um, in the mainland as well with ver varying degrees of risk. So the very first thing I would recommend is you need to do a very honest and open risk assessment, bringing in different stakeholders that can view what your risk level is from different perspectives. And then as I tell all um, NGOs that I do capacity building with, and I would you know say to businesses as well, you need to really look at your mission and you need to really think through, given these risks, are we able to still achieve our mission while we're still in Hong Kong? And if that answer is no, then you'll need to take a step back. And so we've already seen this happening with um, a lot of different organizations, um, pulling out not only their international staff, but also their local staff as well, who they fear wouldn't be able to do their job safely if they were based in Hong Kong. If you are still staying in Hong Kong, obviously uh, having strategic partnerships is very critical, but keeping in the back of your mind that the situation could very likely change quickly. And I think, you know, we can't say that the situation in mainland China has been stagnant. It has been growing more and more repressive since 2015, not just for NGOs, but also in the business sector. So you constantly have to be reevaluating your risk level in the country, along with your mission and the reason why you're there. And the final thing I do just want to point out is even if you're doing business there as a third party operator, as an NGO or as a business, you also have to take into consideration the people that you're engaging with on the ground who would not be able to leave, your vendors, your stakeholders, your beneficiaries, because just by simply talking to you or being engaged or associated with you could put them at great risk. If you take a look at the list of evidence from China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs of US interference in Hong Kong, it was the bulk of it was about meetings, meetings that were publicly acknowledged and publicized in the media. Uh, this was their evidence of, of interference. And so just having a meeting with a foreigner could put somebody at risk. So you definitely need to keep that in your calculus of how you may be increasing the risk of others in Hong Kong. Thank you both. Uh, let me go to the questions in the Q&A and start with one that hasn't come up yet in our conversation. So. Uh, one attendee says, uh, how would you tell international audiences that the upcoming uh, legislative election in December jeopardizes the rule of law and judicial independence in the city? As somebody might argue that even before the NSL, LegCo elections had never been fully democratic or representative at all. Yeah, the short answer to that is that um, uh, the electoral system has been so substantially reformed that um, uh, people of different political views, uh, definitely if you're a Democrat, um, you would be allowed to run in prior elections, um, uh, that you would not be disqualified, uh, you will not be screened out or fettered out by the executive authorities. Now, laws have been changed so that the chief secretary together with the National Security Committee can make a decision to say you are not qualified to run in an election and that decision is not reviewable by the courts. 
Um, so they say you are not fit and you're not fit. Uh, then, and also the nomination requirement is so high, has been changed that, you know, when I ran for the legal profession uh, seat, um, you know, all I need is the signature of 10 lawyers, any 10 lawyers, then I, I'll get it. And nowadays the nomination requirement for uh, uh, electrical count, uh, legislative council election is that you need to get nomination from all the different sectors, including the probaging sectors before you can actually run in the race. Now, assuming you can run, uh, you know, the security committee will run background checks on you uh, and they would uh, examine everything that you said uh, uh, in your lifetime uh, to say uh, whether you are sufficiently patriot, patriotic enough to uh, stand in an election. So what you would see, as I said at the beginning of the talk, is that basically same color for the legislative council. Um, uh, you would have, um, um, I would say, 99 percent of probaging appointees in the system. And um, that is very, very different. If you follow Hong Kong politics uh, in the past, that is a game changer, a paradigm shift. So um, to your broader question, um, what does that impact on the rule of law? Well, if laws are, are, are being driven through uh, the Legislative Council without uh, really substantive scrutiny, as we are seeing now, um, that has an impact on uh, how the courts operate because the court has to operate on the basis of the laws that are passed by the Legislative Council. And we heard that even more draconian laws are coming by way of the new Article 23 legislation. You would have laws about fake news, you have laws about doxing, uh, and also a supercharged sedition uh, uh, offenses are coming. If laws are not, you know, when I was a lawmaker, you know, at least, um, you know, and, and in my pr previous generation, my predecessors, um, they would look at the piece of legislation and scrutinize it uh, with uh, a very um, minute detail on common law standards, whether it fits human rights standards, whether this is drafted correctly, et cetera, et cetera. And back in the old days, the authorities will actually react and counter propose. OK, we hear you. How about we amend the wording? This We are not seeing any of that uh, as of late. And going forward, I don't expect. Uh, people to go into that level of, uh, of scrutiny. So the laws coming out of the Legislative Council, not to mention the laws that are directly promulgated by Beijing to be applied to Hong Kong, will have a very different color uh, on, on how the legal system will uh, uh, um, continue to operate going forward. And I think that is something that people should be aware of, that the political and legal changes combined um, uh, changes the legal system. And I think, you know, the other thing we need to do is take a step back. It's not like we're going to flip a switch and things will just be, you know, judicial independence and rule of law are going to be gone after this election. We need to kind of look at the compounding impacts of the effects of the, the oath taking law. If you look at how it's fundamentally reshaped district councils and who's going to be running for those um, elections, if you look at what it's done in the civil service with people um, quitting their jobs uh, in the bureaucracy in Hong Kong, you know, this is going to have a fundamental change because you're soon, soon, depending on how quickly this takes uh, place, going to have just sort of a single focus of a, or a single type of individual that will be applying for these jobs in the bureaucracy, that will be able to feel confident in running uh, for these elections, because it's not just about getting the nomination and being able to run as a candidate, once you are actually in office, you're still at risk of being disqualified and then having to pay back all of the money that you, all of your salary for when you were in office. And that is a significant uh, barrier uh, emotionally for a lot of people to be running for office. So this compounding effect uh, of all of these laws um, will continue to create this atmosphere where we're not seeing the scrutiny that Dennis was talking about, where we're seeing the implementation of a laws through a singular focus that's just national security. And that is where things will become problematic. And you, you may also lose your pension. Uh, if you're a civil servant or a, a, a member of the judiciary, if they summarily dismiss you on grounds of breach of oath, not only if you pay back millions of dollars of salaries, possibly, and also you lose your pension. So you go figure uh, whether, you know, people don't feel that kind of knife uh, at the top of their head that could uh, strike at any moment if you do something wrong. Thanks. Let's try to fit in one or two more questions. So there's a question somewhat related to what we're just speaking about that shows up in the chat box. Let me quickly read it. Since your paper appears to suggest that the independence of the judiciary is increasingly under threat because of the NSL, the increasing interference on the PRC, 
when do you think will be time or what will be the triggers to finally declare that the judiciary is no longer independent? Side note, some UK Supreme Court justices still consider Hong Kong's judiciary as independent and therefore uh, there's no reason for them not to take up their position as non-permanent judges in the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeals. So uh, maybe toss that first to you, Dennis, and perhaps you could explain uh, uh, the, the role of non-permanent uh, judges in the uh, CFA. Thanks. Yeah, so we have this constitutional tradition where we would invite uh, judges, eminent judges from other Commonwealth jurisdictions to come sit at the uh, Court of Final Appeal as a non-permanent judge. Um, what I, I hope these uh, uh, non-permanent judges uh, potential appointees will understand is the paradigm shift that we're talking about. It's not just about the national security law. It's the change to the whole political structure and the weaponization of the oath taking system. When they come out here, um, you know, they, how much do they really understand that the, the old Hong Kong, which they uh, imagine still exists, doesn't exist anymore. And then they need to understand that the colleagues in the Hong Kong judiciary is facing a very different uh, uh, sets of pressure and games uh, that will, um, you know, I think uh, changed the systematic independence of the uh, judiciary. Um, I used to say that the judiciary in Hong Kong is fiercely in independent and it is able to do so because there are mechanisms and, mechanisms and system in place to ensure their independence. But with the introduction of the weaponization of the oath taking system where they could summarily remove people from office and that uh, with the state media uh, 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 preempting uh, what judges should be doing. In one case, the People's Daily came out with an op-ed to say, look, if the CFA doesn't do its job properly in locking someone up in jail, then we will do it for them. Uh, the central people's government will take, you know, uh, will, will do it themselves, basically. Um, so, you know, that kind of combined effect that has on the judiciary, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to say, well, when would be the point where we declare the judiciary dead? Uh, or in terms of independence, I wouldn't want to draw that kind of, you know, definitive conclusion, but the, the threats and the pressures are increasingly on, uh, increasingly on, on, the, on the move up. Uh, and that it is really pressing on uh, a very fragile system to begin with. And now it is um, uh, 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 in, under significant threat. Um, and people uh, need to understand that change. I, I, I read the UK Supreme Court statement. I was rather disappointed that they say that they, are, they believe the uh, Hong Kong judiciary is still significantly independent, but I was disappointed because they didn't give any reasons. Why did they think it is still the case? I would like to you know, know what they know. Maybe they know something that I don't. Let me uh, yeah. listen, uh, uh, let me jump in, if I could, with one last question, which I'll direct to you just so we get a little more on the table. Uh, so how do new data security laws in China affect the reach of regulation of NGOs in China and Hong Kong? And in the uh, questions that came in yesterday, there were a couple uh, in that vein, uh, particularly around data security. Mm -hmm. I'll leave that to Liz. Uh, she's the <laughs> expert on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just want to add one thing to what Dennis was saying was we can't consider judicial independence as, you know, one thing. It's a very nuanced term that involves the structure of the judiciary, the education of the judges, the, the socio-political pressures that we were touching upon um, in the community. And it's a whole host of factors that can put pressures or be open um, in a variety of different systems. So, you know, it's not just in Hong Kong, judiciaries across the globe feel pressures on one or more of those points. And so those are really important factors to be looking at. And it's constantly changing, especially in democracies, because um, democracy is a process, not an end goal. Um, so how the new laws um, in the mainland in, in China have impacted um, NGOs. I mean, I think in uh, terms of Hong Kong, I've touched on that already. We've seen a, a large exodus of activists um, and organizations uh, and not just, you know, the typical activist style organizations have left. Um, in the mainlands, uh, this process has been ongoing since about 2015 um, when the new charity law, or it's not new anymore, when the charity law amendments were being made and when the overseas NGO law were being passed. Um, and what we really saw in the mainland was this um, slow transition from having something around the, the lines of 7,000 international organizations uh, operating in mainland China to at this point, I think there's maybe 200 uh, registered INGOs in mainland China because of these very repressive um, 
laws that restrict the space in mainland China is so significantly. Uh, so a lot of organizations have already had to leave or are have fundamentally retailored uh, their operations. Um, Same in focus, Hong Kong. Right, to, but to focus on China uh, in its global impacts as opposed to what's happening in China right now, unfortunately, that is not to say there aren't groups still working in China and that there aren't people in China still at great risk to themselves doing work. Um, that is still happening, but you have to be very careful and strategic about the way that you're doing it and understand that there's significant risks. Um, to the extent that that's going to be taking place in Hong Kong, you know, we're already seeing this very drastic shift um, as people recalibrate their operations to be able to operate in Hong Kong. With respect to the data security, I mean, NGOs have been at the forefront of this repression for years, and I think have probably significantly better data security um, protocols in place uh, because of this. Uh, so I, I would argue that it's not necessarily impacted them so much because we were already there and already experiencing um, these threats and pressures for years. Yeah, I, 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 just one last observation, Bill, is that what I'm hearing is that people are not getting visas renewed. Uh, the people who work in NGOs and journalists, they go to the Hong Kong Immigration Department, they apply for their visas, and they go back and say uh, the immigration official will actually tell them the matter is now out of our hands. Now, back in old Hong Kong, you would say, what, what do you mean matters out of your hand? You're the immigration department. But nowadays, the, you know, it is understood that all the sensitive um, quote and unquote sensitive visa application, i.e. NGOs and journalists, has to be vetted by the National Security Committee, and they most likely won't be uh, renewed. And one of the most vibrant civil societies in Asia Pacific used to be Hong Kong, and that has been snuffed out. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, we, we should close, but you mentioned a couple of times the National Security Committee, and just in case people haven't read your paper or aren't fully familiar, could you briefly describe uh, this new uh, apparatus, uh, and then after that, we should conclude. Yeah, the National Security Committee is basically consists of the chief executive, all the important, uh, uh, you know, security and police uh, uh, officials, you know, including the director of uh, 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 commissioner of police, director of immigration, the chief secretary, the secretary for justice, and most importantly, two very senior, two or three many senior. Uh, PRC officials uh, sitting on that committee. So basically they decide all matters of national security relating to Hong Kong. Uh, they, um, their decisions, most importantly, are not subject to judicial review by the Hong Kong courts. So if an NSC makes a decision saying that this matter amounts to national security or that this person is not fit for public office, um, uh, whether as a judge or as a, a legal member, those decisions are final and conclusive that you cannot then bring to the court and say, you violated my basic law rights. Um, the court has no jurisdiction to entertain that. And most importantly, the Court of Final Appeal has confirmed that you cannot challenge the national security law on the basis that it breaches the basic law, which was the original constitution of, the base, uh, of Hong Kong. That means that whatever guarantees there were in the basic law, you cannot say, ah, you are violating my right to free speech or freedom of association. Uh, and take those challenges to challenge the operation of the NSL. You cannot do that. The courts will not entertain that. And that is a significant uh, 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 difference from what is before. And that's why I say the NSL is actually the new constitution of the Hong Kong SAR. And it's, it's interesting, if I could just interject, if you have time to read just one of the bail hearing verdicts, uh, I, I highly recommend you do it because they're relatively pro forma, but the sort of fancy footwork uh, that the, the decisions have in trying to demonstrate how their decisions to reject bail uh, pro forma it is very interesting in how they tie it into Article 4, which brings in the ICCPR to uh, the national security law and the basic law as well. You know, even if the basic law still is, uh, in theory, the, the chief law of the lands, the way that it's being interpreted, it, it's just very interesting. Thank you. And uh, my apologies for our running over, but I wanted to be sure we uh, got in this last piece. Uh, I want to thank Dennis. I want to thank Elizabeth. A very stimulating hour. I want to suggest that if you haven't read the paper, please do so. Uh, and I want to thank uh, all the folks uh, at the Ash Center for making this possible. Thank you very much.